Hi. Today we're going to be talking about evolution and natural selection. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about, and I'm sad that we're not in the classroom for it, but I will try my best to keep it exciting. So the first thing that's really important when we talk about evolution is to understand that there's variation in a species, right? So if we look at this picture, these, all of these snails in this picture are Cuban tree snails. They're all the same species. But if you look closely, there's many variations of tree snails, right? There's different sizes, different colors, different amount of little stripey, swirly things, right? Same with humans, right? If you think about humans, even though we're all the same species, we're all a little bit different. We've got different shapes, sizes, colors, textures. Well, how evolution happens is that sometimes one of those variations might pose an advantage. And if that advantage helps an organism survive and reproduce more frequently, those are the genes that get passed down to the offspring more frequently. And if that continues to happen over many generations, that's how we end up with new features um, and new adaptations for a species, which is pretty cool. So someone who you'll always hear about when we talk about evolution is Charles Darwin. He made a journey around the world and made some pretty awesome discoveries that led to his theory of evolution. So let's take a look at them. Let's take a look at them now. So his journey was on the HMS Beagle. This was a ship where he was voyaging for about five years and he went, he left Europe, went all the way around South America, went around the world, saw Australia, South Africa, and then came back to Europe. So he saw organisms on many different continents. The things that he observed on this journey were really important because this is what led him to his theory of evolution. The first thing that he noticed was that, the first thing he noticed was that species vary globally, meaning different parts of the globe. So on different continents that he stopped at, he found organisms that looked similar, but were very different, right? Um, South America, they have the rhea in Brazil. In Africa, there's an ostrich. And in Australia, there's an emu. Both of these are, I mean, all three of these are large, flightless birds. They've got long necks, long legs to run away from predators. But they all look very similar, but they're not that closely related when we look at their DNA, which we can do now. He couldn't do that at the time. So that was one thing that he noticed, an observation that he made. Darwin also observed that species vary locally, meaning in one local habitat or one local place on this particular continent, South America, we've got two different types of rheas. We've got the greater rhea, which is taller, longer neck, and the lesser rhea, rhea which is smaller. They're similar, Right? They look similar, but they're a little bit different, so they vary locally. They live near each other, so that's why they say locally. They're each better adapted for different habitats. One of them lives in the grasslands, where it's colder, harsher, and the other one lives in the scrublands. He also saw, I'm sure you've heard of the Galapagos Islands, right? There's another example, these large Galapagos tortoises. And they're found on many different islands in the Galapagos, but on each island, the tortoise that's found is a little bit different. Some of them have this long neck and this very high shell that you can see in this picture. And that's because on this particular island, these tortoises need to reach higher up to get vegetation to eat. Whereas these tortoises that don't have the long neck and don't have the high shell, can easily find food that's available on the ground. So we can see that we've got similar species that look a little bit different because depending on what their environment is. So they vary locally. And the last thing that he noticed was that species vary over time. So on his journey, he also collected fossils, which are the preserved remains of traces or traces of ancient organisms. So he saw this glyptodon, he found fossils of this organism, which were look, kind of look like a huge armadillo. He also saw that there are actual living armadillos that look very similar to this fossil, but obviously aren't as huge. 
So he made the connection that perhaps millions of years ago, this organism existed and is a distant relative of this particular armadillo. So he concluded that organisms can change over millions of years over time. So once he got home from his voyage, he was able to put together all these observations and start to see some patterns. He noticed that the species that he found in the Galapagos were found nowhere else in the world. He also found that there were finch species that looked very similar, but were on the mainland of South America. So possibly he concluded that something might have happened where maybe a storm blew some of those finches over millions of years ago to the islands, and that over time when they were there, they started adapting to that particular environment. And we'll talk next about how exactly that happens. So natural selection is the answer to all of Darwin's questions. It's the process by which organisms with variations most suited for their environment survive and leave more offspring. So for example, we've got a little chart here. You can see a gray colored duck and maybe in these particular ducks, there are multiple variations. Maybe they can be really light, maybe they can be dark, and maybe most of them are gray. But maybe for whatever reason, the gray ducks blend into their environment and the white ducks and the dark ducks get eaten more frequently by predators. So the gray ducks are going to reproduce more frequently. Maybe all the darker ducks reproduce more frequently. Perhaps it's a dark environment. So the lighter ones get eaten more often. Those don't pass on their genes as often. But the darker ducks do reproduce more often. And then maybe a new mutation comes along that's even darker, and those are even better at surviving. So over many generations, these, this species of ducks becomes darker and darker because those are the genes that are surviving and reproducing most frequently. Okay, so you can kind of see here um, what's happening. So this is a hypothetical population of grasshoppers changing over time as a result of natural selection. So we've got a grasshopper laying eggs here, and then we've got grasshoppers of multiple colors. We've got some gold ones here, some brown ones, some green ones. When a predator comes, if the grasshoppers are on the green grass, the ones that get eaten most frequently are the ones that stick out to the predator, right? The green blend in a little bit more. So the green ones survive and reproduce more frequently, leading to grasshoppers becoming more green over many generations. So you might think, what, under what conditions does natural selection occur, right? How do we get all these different types of finches in the Galapagos Islands that originate for one particular finch species that might have blown over there millions of years ago? How did it turn into all these other different species? So there's three criteria that are needed for natural selection to occur. And these are called the principles of natural selection. So natural selection occurs in any situation which first has more individuals born than can survive. So this is called the struggle for existence. This leads to competition among species, among individuals of a species. So for example, there's a limited amount of water. There's a limited amount of food, a limited amount of mates. The individuals that are best able to get those resources are the ones that are best able to survive and produce more offspring. Second criteria needed is that there needs to be natural heritable variations in a population. Heritable meaning inherited and variations meaning differences. So inherited differences in a population. So let's look at that example. Um, individuals have natural variations among their heritable traits, right? Their phenotypes. And some of those variants make the organism better suited to survive in their environment than others. And that's what leads to adaptations. An adaptation is any characteristic that increases an organism's ability to survive. So for example, retractable claws in cats is an adaptation that helps them survive. Those claws retract, so when they're walking, they're really quiet and you can't hear them. They can sneak up on their prey. And when it's time to attack, they can get those claws out so they can attack their prey. 
some other examples of adaptations. You can see here camouflage. You might not even be able to see this little frog here. It's blended so well into the moss. Um, mimicry is another example of an adaptation. So we've got two species of snake here. One of them's poisonous, one of them's not. But they look similar to each other because that's an adaptation that helps the snake survive. There's also behavioral adaptations. So um, how birds can kind of hold out their wings when they see a predator so they look bigger. This particular crane sees a fox in the distance, so he's trying to look really big. That is a behavioral adaptation that helps him survive, scare off predators, trying to look really big and scary, and that helps him survive and reproduce more frequently. So he'll pass on that behavior to his offspring and hopefully that either they will learn that behavior from the parent or um, perhaps that's just an instinct that's in their genes and that's something that um, the offspring will just start to do on their own. Now when we talk about natural selection, you'll often hear survival of the fittest. In science class, fitness doesn't mean like you're physically fit, like you're really in shape. Fitness describes how well an organism can survive and reproduce in its environment. So it doesn't always mean the strongest and the fastest. Sometimes it means the sneakiest or the most appealing to mates or the most clever. Um, whatever organisms survive and reproduce most frequently in their environment are considered to be the most fit. Okay, so those are the three principles of natural selection. I think in your book it refers to four. I think um, heritable variations is broken down into two. But these are essentially the three things that you need to have in a species in order for natural selection to happen, in order for there to be some sort of change over time. Struggle for existence, variations and adaptations, and survival of the fittest, meaning the strongest will survive. So there needs to be some sort of competition. One example that is often shown with natural selection is the peppered moth. So if you look here, um, the peppered moth normally has two different variations, a lighter color and a darker color, because they live on birch trees. And birch trees, if you know, the bark is white with some black spots. So these can blend in pretty well, but the ones that survive and reproduce most frequently are the lighter colored ones because the bark is light. But during the Industrial Revolution in England, during the late 1800s, there was so much soot and um, pollution in the air from the, all the industries that the normally white um, birch trees became dark gray colored because they were covered with soot from the um, factories. So the lighter colored moths started sticking out more frequently and the darker ones were blending in more. So during the Industrial Revolution, the predators were eating more of the light-colored moths, leaving the darker-colored moths to reproduce more frequently. So the population of peppered moths became mostly dark-colored moths during that time, where before the Industrial Revolution, most of them were light-colored. So this was a clear example of how species can change over just a few generations um, if those principles for natural selection are present.